speakers from this morning to, to come up and uh, have a chair on the stage. This moderated panel session will be led by my colleague Forrest Callan, trauma surgeon, associate chief medical officer for acute care. I'm probably leaving things out, but he, you can add them if, 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 you, if you wish. Uh, good morning. I want to thank everybody for the privilege to be able to moderate this important session. I probably speak for many people present when, uh, when I say that the, uh, the content this morning has just been unbelievable. Uh, and it's, uh, it's striking to me that we're on the precipice of a, of a new era in healthcare of being able to make uh, better decisions and understand the diseases that we're seeing as clinicians in, in a different way than we have previously. I guess it's good news and bad news that uh, MITRE has turned their attention towards healthcare. Uh, obviously, we're grateful for the, uh, the brain power and the analytical capability, but speaking for myself as a clinician, um, I think it also raises the possibility that we're now uh, more dangerous than our Cold War uh, you know, uh, opponents uh, or ISIL uh, if MITRE is interested in healthcare uh, as potentially the next great problem facing the U.S. So um, anyway, uh, I do have some questions from the audience. I, I do hope that uh, all of you out there will potentially text in questions or just raise your hands if the questions that are, that are asked raise yet more questions. And uh, the phone number is 215-977-4401. So, um, uh, thank you all uh, for being here. Uh, we have a few questions from the audience. We'll just start. Uh, Dr. Jason, um, how does uh, fractal in medicine and physiology fit into the behavior of complex systems? Oh, what? Can you hear me okay? Oh, I think it fits in intimately. Well, in fact, uh, a lot of the critical phase transitions that you see in systems are fractal related. Um, in one slide that I had that talked about uh, the idea of multi-practicality, of the ability to look at competing processes at work when systems are undergoing phase transitions, uh, that really brings in the whole idea of fractals. In fact, you, you can look at a fractal as really being sort of the ordinary state of a system uh, where you may have this, this scaling law that applies where uh, the processes that are working are, are, are sort of self-similar to every scale. What's interesting, though, is that as the system begins to change, you have a bunch of competing processes at different fractal, spatial, and temporal scales that come into play during those phase transitions. And a nice thing about that is you're actually able to measure that, that effect. So the whole idea of fractals and multifracticality is, I think, intimately related to this whole concept of, of complex system behavior. Fantastic. All right, for Dr. Shannon, um, I swear this question didn't come from me. Uh, this one's from the audience. Um, as we move from uh, IQ to digital intelligence to artificial intelligence, where does emotional intelligence fit into that continuum? Well, I would suggest that um, uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence um, will complement the providers or the human beings' ability to focus on emotional intelligence. I think creativity and emotional sensing will be the tools of the practitioner uh, aided and abetted by complex information distilled down and available to the clinician uh, as defined, I think, broadly in, in Gary's uh, uh, general description of complex systems, but I think then shown nicely by both Chris and Sean to be readily applicable now increasingly in the hands of a provider. So I don't think machines and information will replace the need for the provider to have a high level of emotional intelligence. In fact, it might allow us to focus more on developing mm -hmm. those capabilities mm -hmm. in providers rather than have them burdened by some of the decision making that I think can be more aptly done using the kind of, of systems that, that Sean and, and Chris described. Fantastic. Sean, uh, any further comment about that? I, I agree in that, um, you know, when you're seeing a patient, I'll keep my mic close to mine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when you're seeing a patient, I would say
say at least 70 to 80 percent of the judgment that you're making is really about the communication that you're having on the spot with the patient. Um, you know, a lot of it is, one, you don't, you don't really know what they've got, right? And so you're trying to make your best judgment, but also you're trying to treat them. And that's where, you know, you have to be thinking about, okay, are they gonna actually be willing to take these medications? What are their, I mean, I see a lot of young people who are, have seizure, you know, have seizure disorder. What are their parents gonna think? How am I gonna communicate with their parents? How are we gonna make sure that we communicate this adequately to other physicians? And what's their life gonna be like, you know, going forward? None of that's on a computer. What is on a computer, though, is like those, those, uh, those, those, those decisions that you could really use some help with. And an example is like this medication in here. Just, just get some help, you know. Don't make the decision for me, but give me some help to try to digest the information down to something that now I don't have to spend all that time, you know, putting data into the computer and, you know, looking at the computer the whole time and I can actually interact with my patient. And I think that's, that's where the real promise of, of these kinds of algorithms is. Excellent. Can, we, can I stretch you a little bit there? You know, can we go further in being able to uh, discern emotional well-being and to record it or discern it through medical records in a way that we currently can't? Uh, do you think there's a, it seems to me that that's well, there's what tried. you sort of showed with your natural language processing, et cetera. Yeah, no, we, I mean, we, there's tries to, and in fact, in the, in the depression study, when, when they did natural language processing to determine if at that visit the patient was depressed or not, it really relied on some very interesting things, like, you know, different, the, the clinicians would use the, the, the words active or interested, and that was like not depressed, right? And then, you know, um, uh, the obvious ones like unhappy and so forth, but also, you know, sleeping and so forth. So I think that um, it can assist. It can, it can certainly it can certainly assist in in that way, kind of looking at the past histories of patients to see, you know, if there were any clues about you know what their what their emotional state might have been. Certainly with M, you know, with all the devices that we have, looking to see if patients um, day to day are depressed by, for example, we can follow whether they're moving a lot or not, and that's been correlated about whether people are depressed or not, which we kind of all know, right? So if you're depressed, you're like in bed or watching TV and so forth. And if you're not, you're often up and talking and interacting with people. And so, but, you know, it can kind of help digest it down into, you know, the, the thing we're wearing. And that can help the clinician to know, you know, if the patient is, you know, consistent with other things, the information they're getting, so they can get the whole picture of the patient. But I would never want that to, like, substitute for the intuition of the doctor because all these things can lie, and that's what you can really see in that data, right? They can all lie, and so you have to be very careful with that. I'm gonna take the privilege of the moderator for a second, and uh, I think there are probably many people in the audience uh, who I'm close to who would predict the next question. Um, uh, so we know that about half of all attending physicians right now are uh, experiencing burnout. We think that 80% uh, of our uh, residents uh, are experiencing burnout. Uh, we think that there's tremendous uh, provider distress out there. Can we leverage analytics, do you think, to look at uh, provider distress? And if so, do we think, I'll ask you know, this of everybody on the panel, do we think that there's uh, a use in trying to uh, move the needle in safety and quality to try and turn our eye towards not just the well-being of the patient, but the well-being of the provider? you can hear me yet, but um, I think one of the things we're starting to learn as we interact with these uh, um, advanced computer systems and, and advanced analytics, we, we become more aware of what our capabilities are and what they're not. So an example of that is we have a, 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 a Coumadin monitoring and treatment algorithm that we use, a, a computer-based algorithm. And we've been able to show over time that that algorithm um, produces better outcomes in avoiding and having people avoiding a, a bleeding uh, episode from having their blood too thin or a clotting episode from having their blood too thick, right? It, the, 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 um, the, the standard protocol um, produces better outcomes than allowing every physician to do their own, um, you know, personalized touch to Coumadin management for those patients. 
that's kind of frustrating for physicians because one of the ways we, we we're trained is that quality comes into the room when I walk into the room. Mm. Um, and, and the more intelligent I am, the better trained I am, the better places that I've trained at, the more experienced I am, then the better quality I can bring to the table. And we look around and, and you know, certain physicians' names achieve certain status because everyone in the room knows that they're a high quality physician. But what we're learning is that there's a limit to the quality that we can bring as humans and human computers in certain areas of data crunching, right? Um, we know, for example, that in, in our ICU environments at Intermountain Healthcare, that the same physician and the, given the same patient will make different choices looking at the same sets of parameters at different times of the day. And the reason we believe that is is because of our inability as human brain, you know, data processors to consistently weight all of the data elements the same when we're mm -hmm. making choices. So we begin to recognize that if we can take off of our plate certain um, choices that we understand fairly well and hand the crunching of those numbers to an information system and give that data back to us, that frees up our minds to do other things. Some of the, you know, like that, you know, other, other things. But it also, I think it's, it's something we've got to continually learn about, right? So what are we good at? We, we say fairly easily, and I think most people in the room would agree, that we are better at judgment than computers. We're not as good at data crunching, but we're better at judgment. In other words, I could walk in and look at a, a patient in the emergency room and say, that kid's sick, mm -hmm. right? I don't know why I know that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the reason I don't know why is because I am, I'm gathering all sorts of data, visual data, auditory data, you know, olfactory data, social data, um, ab about this patient that I'm not even aware that I'm gathering. But I have these capacities that I'm not paying attention to that are immense. And I do think that analytics over time will expose more and more what we are good at doing, what we're capable of doing, and what we're not capable of doing. That's fascinating. <clears throat> so uh, if I heard you correctly, one of the things I, I think I heard you say is that we can think about the receiver operating characteristic curves uh, looking at whether or not the child is sick or not. And you can recognize your own ability to uh, use yourself as a human sensor uh, to assess you know, probably a thousand different data points simultaneously. Right. Uh, some that are uh, extremely subtle, you know, the beads of sweat on the brow, the anxious look on the, on the face of the, of the parent. Is there a way to somehow uh, integrate human sensors uh, into the, the analytic spectrum? Well, that's a question for the real brains in the room, I think. Uh, but, but I think we do that, right? And I think that's what I'm, I'm trying to say is that we have the capacity and we don't recognize that we do to recognize the beads of sweat, to know that the, this, I remember one woman coming in, I'm a family physician, right? And, and um, this woman, I had delivered three of her babies um, and she never asked for pain medicine in any of those <laughs> events. This was in Wisconsin where you're not a woman until you've delivered a baby with no pain medicine. <laughs> And, um, you know, uh, in, in Utah, we're, we're not uh, the other way around. We always give everyone an epidural <laughs> right before they <laughs> deliver. But um, she came into the emergency department complaining of abdominal pain. <laughs> and I got a report about that the next day in my office. And I gave her a call and I said, you get in here right now. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and I said, what did they give you? They said, well, they gave me an antacid and told me to go home. And I said, are you still having abdominal pain? Yes. And I said, you are sick. We have to figure out what's going on. And sure enough, she had gallstone pancreatitis. Right. But that was my ability as a physician to say, there's a data element of her complaining of pain that's new. It's, a, it's something that I was able to focus on and detect. So we do that really well. Whether we want to let computers replace that, and I, I think has to do with how well and how consistently we can do it, and does it provide value. Um, where, where it doesn't, we could spend a lot of time replacing things that we do well and not provide a lot of value. Yeah. Yeah, could I mention something too? Uh, th this sort of gets to the whole issue of cognitive assistance in, in the medical field. And a, a, a complementary example of that is uh, MITRE several years ago worked in the sonar community on next generation sonars. And being engineers, we put our engineer's hat on and we went on board. and. Help, help them to quote unquote redesign their sonar system. Well, being engineers, we, we took the human out of the loop and basically automated the entire process. The sonar operators 
hated it. Why? <laughs> because it took the decision process out of their decision process out of the loop. That was an important lesson learned for us because what we literally had to do is to go back and design toolkits or toolboxes to assist them in helping them. Because remember, the whole issue as far as the sonar operator was concerned was that everything was undermanned because of the economy. So they were up to here basically in workload, yeah. okay? They couldn't handle the workload. But if you provided them with tools to assist them in the process, then they're happy. They're still making the decision, but they're also relying on the tools to help them. And that was an important lesson from our part, I think, that you can sort of transfer over into the healthcare community as well, that we don't want to automate the entire process. Yep. We want to provide tools to assist the physician. Right, right. Did you have a comment? I, I was gonna say, so even at the, sometimes at the, at the time when you might think you need computers most. So at end of life, right, we, people get into an ICU and it takes massive computers to actually be able to control, you know, your, your, I see your, your intracranial pressure is being monitored, your heart rate and, you know, I mean, resp everything, O2, everything's being monitored, right? And your electrolytes are almost being monitored sometimes on a, on a minute by minute scale. And you're, you're living on a knife's edge, so to speak, and a computer can actually allow that to happen. And then we forget to ask a patient, you know, about their, what they want and what their quality of, and, and think about what their quality of life is. And so I think what we don't want to happen is we don't want computers to bring us into this era where we're managing everything, you know, on this knife's edge, trying to like drive ourselves into what a computer would think would be a good state, you know, a perfect physiological state, and forget to ask the patient, you know, okay, well, is this where you really want to be going? And if it's not, and if you don't want to be managed this way, and this applies to, you know, patients who are just being managed for their care, right? Because a lot of times this, the, 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 the new, um, way of, of managing a patient's care is to be monitoring very, very carefully, right? You have a nurse going out there every day and so forth, and we think that's, that's great, but that not, might not be so great for the patient. So trying to make sure that we come to the right appreciation for what the patient wants, you know, even when computers seem to be like the most obvious solution of things, I think is really critical, and we have to not just let it carry us in that direction. Awesome. So for Dr. Schnitzer, um, one of our audience members asked, uh, isn't uh, hand washing a historical example of uh, another critical uh, safety practice that took a long time to, to adopt? And, and if so, uh, recognizing that the integration of more and more data points into clinical care and somehow figuring out a way to get these in the consciousness of the clinician as they're seeing the patient, how are we going to avoid a hundred year gap uh, between our current state of the kind of um, you know, data repository mining that you know, Dr. Murphy showed us today to a place where we're actually able to use those data in clinical practice? So uh, the short answer to the question is yes. It's a perfect example of uh, the slow rate of adoption uh, for actually no good reason than the fact, than the simple fact that the hardest thing to change about humans is human behavior. Uh, and uh, we've all seen that, we all know that. So we can always expect that to be an issue uh, for anything that we try to do that's new and different. So th that's absolutely the case. The, the other, I've been listening intently to this conversation, so I'm gonna answer three or four questions in Good. succession. So I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll go back and then I'll come to the last one. So, uh, so the one about um, uh, can we use uh, different tools to solve different problems. It depends on the data that you're looking at. So we kind of get locked in a little bit to thinking about the data and the kinds of data elements we have today. Let's think about the data we're gonna have five or 10 years from now, or different data that we could have today if we just explored it a little bit more, more completely. So the question about mental status, about whether you're distressed, about whether you're depressed, We've actually got a little study going on right now at MITRE where we're looking at uh, human voice tracings from interviews and looking for characteristics of the waveform analysis that tell us whether or not that patient might have post-traumatic stress disorder. And if so, how bad is it? And then serially over time, if, they're being if they've been diagnosed and are being treated, is it getting better, worse, or staying the same on therapy? So using 
new insights in terms of kinds of data, and that's not a technique that's used today. That's not a data source that we use when we do a, an assessment of a patient's mental status to determine whether or not they have post-traumatic stress or whether they're getting better or worse from it. And that's just an example. So I would argue there are lots of sensors and technologies out there that can pull in new information. And oh, by the way, it doesn't always have to be in the setting of a clinical, of a traditional clinical interaction. So think about getting data, and somebody pointed to their wrist a little, a few moments ago. Think about collecting data on people as they go about their everyday lives and integrating that into the context of how well or not are they? Are they getting better? Are they getting worse? Are they about to have an event this afternoon that nobody knows about, but using predictive analytics, we could give them a call and say, come on in and do something about that. And oh, by the way, you can use all that to answer your question and for the provider as well. So we could actually monitor caregivers and see how they're doing, mentally and physically, every moment of every day if they wanted, to make sure they're in the zone and on the right trajectory and use predictive analytics of the kind uh, that Randall's talking about to make sure that a clinician isn't going to fall off the cliff this afternoon uh, in a way that we uh, don't expect. And then lastly, I think we have to think about, you know, as we particularly, we like to think about computers, but think about the inputs to the computers, not only the data, but the sensors. Where's the information going to come from? What's it going to look like? Yes, we human beings are phenomenal in terms of our ability to sense information and pull it in, and we use our senses, our five senses, to do that. But think about the other kinds of sensors that are out there, and if we could augment our sensors with other sensors and then integrate it in a useful fashion where we took huge amounts of data and were able to convert it into information and ultimately knowledge, we could change everything about how we practice while still maintaining the human context and still making the decisions. And the last thing I wanted to bring up is a couple of questions ago. Somebody asked about emotional intelligence, and we were thinking about it in terms of the practitioner. But as Rick and I were discussing yesterday, emotional intelligence is also really important for leadership. Mm. So if you're thinking about organizations and how to mag manage organizations, you don't want a smart computer. You want a leader with great emotional intelligence. And the examples we gave this morning of some of these organizations had leaders with phenomenal EQs in addition to IQs. I, I love those answers. I, it recently uh, came to my attention that um, uh, we all know that physicians die differently uh, than the population. Uh, what I didn't know is that uh, we lose approximately one medical school uh, per year of uh, physicians to suicide uh, every year. Um, that, that fact just recently came to my awareness, and so this thing about provider well-being, not only is it probably important just to, you know, look at the uh, well-being of us as individual providers, doctors and nurses alike, um, but there's also the very real possibility that um, our efficacy and the ability to produce the kind of outcomes we want organizationally may be limited by, you know, by the emotional well-being of our doctors and nurses. So um, I, I love that, the idea of doing um, novel data analysis to look at things such as voice stress and that sort of thing to look at well-being. Uh, sure. I'm just uh, thinking about the fact that... Um, Sometimes we're just not taking advantage of the data we already have. This was happening at Intermountain Healthcare around provider um, well-being. Simple data, just looking at when notes were completed. It's not very sophisticated data, but we have it already. We know, uh, for example, we can tell how long it takes somebody, how long somebody spends looking at lab values, how long they spend completing a note or completing orders. We started to create visual graphics of this by physician at Intermountain Healthcare. And we discovered a new phenomenon that was happening called pajama time. Now, this, all the doctors know about it. You put in an electronic health record, and suddenly you go through your day, you come home to eat dinner, then you go back on the computer and finish your notes in your pajamas, right? Pajama time. And so, uh, but we, we could identify physician by physician who was doing this and who wasn't. And it turns out there's a large number of physicians who aren't doing it at all and who don't spend very much time at all looking at data or completing their notes or completing their orders. And there's others that are spending inordinate amount of time. And this has allowed us to take our, our excellent physician leaders with the high EQs and apply them to specific physicians and say, there's just a few things that if you learned, you could go home with all your notes done. You know? yeah. And it, 
Things like that are extraordinarily powerful, but we don't think to reach out to the data that we already have in our systems. Dr. Shannon, I'm uh, sure you have some remarks uh, and some reactions to some of what you've heard. I think um, uh, Chris made a, a very important point in his presentation that I think is a contributor to uh, some of the factors around provider burnout, and that is the concept of measuring things that matter to patients. We are consumed in regulatory measures, uh, most of which any normal human being find totally inexplicable, right? Infections per thousand wine days and these things shrouded in complex metrics for the purposes of regulation as opposed to am I going to get better or worse and what's the likelihood I incur a complication or not and how soon can I get back to work? So, so I think that, that the average provider is awash in two worlds, trying to meet the needs of a patient, which have different measures that matter, and at the same time organizationally meeting and, 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 and dancing to the drum of all these, what I would call tyranny of, of regulatory measures. I think that's a burnout factor. I also think unstable systems uh, in which people work create huge burnout. The idea that there's nothing predictable about a provider's day. Um, that whether the OR goes off on time or whether the laboratory test returns on time or what the weight would be for the MRI today are all factors that in high reliable systems can certainly be managed in a way toward a rhythmicity to the day for a provider. But uh, I'm always struck in my own organization how chaotic any given individual's moment of interaction is. And, and that's about, I think, the stability of the systems. And parenthetically, I think if you superimpose even the very best cognitive computing capabilities on unstable systems, you won't get the benefits that I think are so highly promised in what we see. So Jay gave two examples of this, I think, in his presentation. Virginia Mason is all about the redesign of those systems. Right, so things work on time in a predictable way using a Toyota methodology. Um, and I think with respect to wellness, what Jay didn't mention about Toby Cosgrove is much of the Cleveland Clinic's renaissance was based upon improving the well-being of the Cleveland Clinic providers. So there are eight measures at the Cleveland Clinic of wellness of the workforce weight reduction, diabetes control, blood pressure control, smoking cessation, daily exercise activities that are monitored on behalf of the entire Cleveland Clinic population. And that's about them taking care of themselves. And interestingly enough, most of us in the room have self-insured programs for our employees. You know, certainly the providers tend, uh, medical providers tend to have this. So that's a case where we do have a fully integrated system. We are paying the premium and providing the care, and one could think about novel ways to use those premium dollars toward investing in the preservation of wellness for the workforce as opposed to paying for their chronic conditions when they largely go ignored. And arguably, without that healthy workforce, all of the power of this computational capability, I think, will, will won't be realized. Great answer. All right, let's shift gears a little bit. Uh, Dr. Jay Snow, uh, one of the audience members asked us uh, a, a question about how can we fix the inaccuracy of large data sets like the Social Security death master file. Uh, wouldn't it seem like that would be uh, an important thing if we're going to start to link uh, healthcare processes to outcomes, uh, especially uh, arguably the most important outcome, which is death? Uh, probably so. Uh there are limitations, obviously, to where the community is in, in dealing with this whole issue of, of complex systems. Uh, when you get to structured or, or unstructured records, it, it becomes a, a little more dicey. A, a lot of the, the work that we've been doing, uh, particularly on complex systems, has to do with imagery data or one-dimensional time series kind of information. Uh, extending that to, say, Social Security kinds of issues uh, is going to involve basically looking at lots of documents, doing linguistic analysis on the documents, pulling out content, and doing the analysis that way. It, it's not that it has not been done before. In fact, MITRE is involved to a pretty large degree with the IRS and actually mapping out uh, tax laws. Okay, and the way we do this 
is we look at network graphs, which is really a subset of, of complexity theory, of looking at the topological relationships between documents, but also their functional relationships as well. Because there are a number of documents in the tax code that draw on f other fundamental documents. And if you understand that connection, okay, you not only have a great way to retrieve that information, but you can start understanding sort of the whole functional nature of the tax code, looking at it that way. And the idea would be to sort of extend that to the, the healthcare area as well. It's not that it hasn't been done, it's just that there, there are so many different problems on the table now. Uh, we were choosing more or less the low-lying fruit first before, you know, attempting to, to get to the harder problems. So how do we fix these, uh, you know, the problems with the current data sets, like the Social Security uh, death registry? You know, it's uh, profoundly flawed. Um, does it have to be redone from, you know, from the, you know, from the very conception of it? Or can we modify the processes? What do we do to get to more reliable public data sets? Well, I think uh, eventually you're going to have to modify the entire process. But, but you don't have to start from scratch. Uh, as, as long as you can figure out what, again, the network of functional relationships are between elements in there, that's a start because it provides sort of a skeleton or exoskeleton that you can build on. Excellent. Dr. Wood, um, who customizes the clinician interface uh, at, at your place? Is it an internal team? Uh, how's that done? Yeah, it, um, the, we're more successful when um, the team that is modifying the, 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 the interface is as close to the front line as they can get. The, the further back or the further up the organization they are when they're doing that, the, the worse the results are for burnout or <laughs> success for anything. When we pull in into um, a central meeting room, the right minds in our organization and have them sit at the table and build a user interface around a specific clinical process we understand now, we didn't understand at the start, that that team of clinical experts will get it wrong and in, in over a hundred ways. <laughs> and that the best thing we can do is use that approach. There's a recent book about this. Where it's, I think it's a ready, fire, aim. <laughs> where you, as quickly as you can, you get the interface into the clinical environment and begin to understand from frontline clinicians using that interface what works about it and what doesn't work about it. We have, uh, our goals are that we need an information system that allows us to decide on a change and make that change and bring it into, through testing and bring it back into operation in two hours. Um, and and that's, that's sort of the pace we, now we'd love to get it faster than that, but you've got to get it through testing and it has to be in alignment with all the sort of standards around FDA approvals and other things um, and documentation about the changes that you're making so that you can achieve all of those regulatory compliances, right? But uh, unless you have that level of interaction with your front frontline clinicians, it will take forever um, to get to the point where you have a useful uh, clinician interface. So um, we try to build into our um, clinical programs people who have the capacity to modify the electronic health record. And we try, we're learning now that we have to teach them not only how to do that, but how to modify it in a way so that the next time we take a release of the electronic health record from the company, we can actually accept that release. It doesn't break every single process that we've built. And that's an important lesson for electronic health record companies too. They want to be able to share with us the innovations that their teams of engineers are doing but unless they figure out ways to allow us to, to take those changes, um, we'll remain tied to the customizations we've made um, for years and, and even decades. Uh, let me follow that up. Uh, one of our audience members sort of noted a purposeful, um, I'm not sure neglect is, uh, that may be too strong of a word, but uh, a decision to not focus on the external reportables. Um, tell us about how that's affected such things as um, uh, regulatory hurdles, meaningful use, uh, finance, et cetera, in your organization. We know you've saved $100 million in, in um, looking at variation in s such things as surgical supplies. Tell us about how uh, this focus has changed the, the conversation in the C-suite. Well, I, I want to be clear um, that uh, Intermountain is not non-compliant with all of those reportables. I mean, <laughs> we're, a very, 
we're a hyper-compliant organization. <laughs> uh, and so we, we will report on everything that uh, we have been asked to report on by our insurance companies and by, our, uh, by the federal government, by, our, by the state government. What we notice is that we value less the benefits we get from those reportables compared to the benefits we get from looking at our shared baselines of care in areas where we can define that there's great variability in how we provide care. So um, an example, a classic example is there used to be, and I don't, I'm gonna get this wrong, so let's not, please don't kill me on the, on the details, but um, there was a, a requirement to um, give uh, smoking cessation education to patients before they leave the hospital. This is a great example. Um, so we had to figure out not only who was going to give the education, but how they were going to document that they gave the education because you have to, you have to get a coded data element in the electronic health record or somewhere that says, yes, this patient was in our hospital. Yes, they received edu you know, education about that. So now we're spending a lot of, uh, of uh, intellectual property on trying to just figure out how, you know, who's gonna put this information in, how are we gonna get that, um, that documentation lever uh, in the proper place, and then, you know, are we at 80%, 87%, 99%? Okay, we're at 99.9%. Why can't we get it to 100%? Somebody needs to be killed. Somebody needs to be you know, fired. Okay, what was the outcome of all of this? Nobody quit smoking, right? So um, that was, all of that effort was wasted. And I think th those are the types of things that we can learn, we should be learning from. That didn't produce an outcome that patients would care about. Are there other efforts that produce the outcome of, of people quitting smoking. Um, yeah, and probably they have more to do with social impact of some famous person saying, you know what, I'm gonna quit smoking. <laughs> that probably has more impact than everything we did. So we have to continually ask and answer the question, what is the value of these reportables? Perfect, thanks Chris. Um, so last question for Dr. Murphy. Um, tell us about the trade-off between de-identification and preserving useful data. Tell us about some of the trade-off choices there. Okay. Uh, so, you know, when HIPAA came out back in uh, 2003, um, there was, um, there was a, a general outcry that we were gonna lose, you know, what we could do with our data um, uh, for, for science and, 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 and lots of other endeavors because, you know, we couldn't keep our identifiers on it. And I think that um, what we have had to do is become very creative on how we do it and also uh, make sure that we understand who really needs to look at the data and who does not need to look at the data. Because some people really need to look at the data. Um, certainly clinicians really need to look at the data. Um, public health uh, and so forth often need to look at the data. And researchers need to look enough at the data to understand if the validity of what they're doing uh, um, is, is reasonable. But there's other approaches that you can use to um, uh, check your data. And those approaches don't necessarily need identify data in the hands of everybody who's looking at the data. So there's a concept of honest broker, for example, that's come up, which is very popular, where somebody has put together a whole bunch of identifiers on a project and manages the fact that you know, like, that the people who are in this project here and the people in this project here have a certain amount of overlap and who the patients are. And then the honest broker knows exactly who the patients are. But in the projects, you just need to know what the linkage is, right, what the patient linkage is. And so you don't necessarily need everybody in that large project to know who the patients are. And so this is the concept of, of, of having coded patients in your data. And then you also have this concept of what it takes to de-identify uh, unstructured data. So what the notes need to be, have done to them in order to make sure that they're truly de-identified. One of the things we have to be careful of, so I think that there's, there's, there's sufficiently creative ways that we can deal with the identification, that you can't just say, well, we can't do anything with it, so everything's gonna be identified. That's, that's just not the right approach. The one thing you do also need to be very careful about is that the government has put together uh, certain guidance about, for example, what constitutes a de-identified data set. 
And if you don't read it very carefully, you'll think that HIPAA says all you need to do is take out 16 identifiers, right, which is, uh, you know, like name and social security number, and then you have to restrict the dates and the zip codes. But the fact is that in, 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 in our very rich clinical data, everybody can be identified through simply a panel of lab tests. So a study was done by Jim Cimino at, uh, he was at the NIH then, I think he's at, uh, 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 anyway, he's at North Carolina. But now, but what he did was he said, okay, if you, if you get a panel of lab tests which has specific values up and down to like, you know, the second decimal point, and you just know that they're all in the same lab, that it's, a, it's a panel, and here's the results, can you identify a person through that? 99.5% of the patients could be identified by just knowing the results of one of their lab panels and then looking for them in a supposedly de-identified set. So what did the government get wrong? They didn't get anything wrong. In, in HIPAA, it actually says you can't have overly identifying information, but people don't actually pay attention to that little extra point. So, so you don't want to have the illusion that you have a de-identified data set either with this very rich clinical data and not really have one. So you have to kind of approach it both places where you don't want to, you know, you want to be creative enough that you can create, a, you know, that there's options to create a limited data, a, a, a de-identified data set, but then you don't want to be, uh, have blinders on and say, okay, we've created our de-identified set, you know, we've, we've gone what we think are the rules and that's it. You have to be very, you know, thoughtful about the two aspects of creating them. And then I think, you know, that, that um, there, there's a tremendous amount of research that can be done using, using the identified data. Perfect. Well, on behalf of the conveners, um, the audience members, I want to thank all the panelists. Please round of applause for our panelists. Uh, we're going to come back at 1 o'clock, and uh, bon appetit. <laughs>